I'm Mark Gagan and you're listening to the Voice of Insurance podcast, produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Today's guest is Phil Hobbs, President and Managing Director at Liberty Specialty Markets. In the past, Liberty Mutual businesses used to be run allowing a lot of autonomy and sometimes geographical and operational overlap. But these days, Liberty is a business that has undergone a huge amount of work to unify and structure and present much more of a united front globally. And when you hear that specialty markets now produces $24 billion of gross written premium, making it one of the largest commercial PNC insurers in the world, you can see why it makes an awful lot of sense to project and leverage that sort of scale out in the marketplace. That's what makes this such an interesting discussion. When Phil joined Liberty 15 years ago, He had a role in the group's Lloyd Syndicate. Now he has a completely global view, and only half of the premium he oversees is written in London. And because the business is a buyer and seller of reinsurance and retro, very few other organisations have such a joined-up view of the insurance value chain in its entirety, and with such breadth and depth. Given the turbulent state of the market, Phil's view is extraordinarily valuable. Here we talk in depth about how the recent reinsurance reset might affect market dynamics and insurance, as well as grappling with the state of play in core London specialty classes, cyber, resurgent inflation, ESG, and the post-pandemic work environment. Phil is very articulate, and his calm and easygoing demeanour permeates our exchanges. He's also very good at making very complicated processes and dynamics much easier to understand, and that's why I think a listen today will be really well rewarded. Enjoy the podcast. Phil. Welcome to Voice of Insurance. Thank you. How long have you been in, in this job? It has been six months now. Six um, months? Time flies? Yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting six months, certainly a busy six months, but it's uh, yeah, great to join you today. Absolutely. Well, thanks very much for coming on the show. Your predecessor was in the job for quite a while. It takes a while for everyone to get used to a new leader. What might be different about your leadership style from your predecessor? I was the deputy managing director here, working closely with Matthew for five years. So in some ways, that's a continuity appointment. You know, you could see that as not much changing. But regardless of my current style, what I would say is that the style that I'm going to need to have is very much as a transformational leader. And that's really to do with the changes that have gone on around the wider Liberty Group and Global Risk Solutions, which I'm now part of the executive team. So my role is actually quite different to my predecessor in that respect. I'll probably only spend half of my time here in London. I would say that very much it's a transformational leadership role, and that's a big challenge, and I'm looking forward to it. So when you say transformational, is it all about the process, the digitization, that kind of thing? It's really to do with how the group's organized. So previously, Liberty Specialty Markets, we didn't have a lot of contact with our US business and Global Risk Solutions now has been organized. Big part of that is Matthew's new role, overseeing underwriting globally. And we're very much looking at the firm as a whole and how we bring the whole balance sheet and the firm's whole capabilities to our customers. And that's quite a big change. So that's a big change in terms of the underwriting side. It's also a big change how we arrange ourselves operationally through things like finance, our operations function. So internally and indeed ultimately externally for our customers, it's quite a big transformation that we're going through to really improve the way Liberty operates. Because as a business, you had previously, maybe 15 years ago, you'd have been in different silos. The syndicates were separate from the company and the European company, market company and other things. And you've been through all sorts of different transformations. But now this is much to say that Global Risk Solutions is a global corporate risk business in general, right? I joined actually at the end of 2006 in what was then Liberty Syndicate, yes, yes, yes. which was a totally separate unit it from was, everything else in the group and indeed separate from our European company, which was across the street in London. So in some ways to me, this feels like a culmination of various, you know, when Liberty Specialty Markets was formed, we merged the company and the syndicate in London. And now we've got a truly global business with a global executive team that I'm part of that is leading the business as a one GRS. And how big is GRS now as a global entity if it were all one big balance sheet? I'm sure it all isn't. As it consolidates, what what is it? So overall, the GWP is about $24 billion. Um, So we are one of the largest commercial PNC insurers in the world. And really, a lot of the work that's been done over the last six months or even a year has been thinking about, well, actually, how do we start to 
leverage that and combine our capabilities as these previously separate businesses around the world. And also as part of that, your reinsurance is now sort of going to market as also as effectively a global reinsurer in terms of the way it presents itself to Cedents. Is that right? That's right. So what we did with LMRE is we've effectively elevated it in the group structure so that it sits at the top level. And really that's about us maximizing our capital. How do we think about allocating capital to reinsurance versus insurance at different points in the cycle? And previously, our reinsurance business, LMRE, wasn't very connected to our US business, for example, or our surety business. And that's changing. And that's going to allow us to make some better decisions from the top down to do with capital allocation. Well, that's really interesting. Obviously, it's probably a good time to talk about the market itself, because obviously you've been transforming yourself internally as a huge organization. But it's been an incredible change in the market, a turn in the market, particularly within the reinsurance world. So again, your own decisions around capital allocation must really have been challenged over the last couple of quarters. Can you run us through what has changed at 1-1? Obviously, as a buyer of reinsurance, also you're a seller of reinsurance, how your balance must have changed as an organisation, because I presume you've had difficult decisions to be confronted with to either try and buy more reinsurance at that much higher price, or maybe there was less reinsurance available, and maybe it wasn't at the right sort of price. And at the same time, presumably because you're such a large organisation, you've got much more flexibility about being able to retain more if you need to. There's a lot of moving parts to well, that. There's a I huge mean, we're, amount, yeah. yeah. As you say, we're a buyer and a seller. And I, maybe, maybe start with the retro market where we are a significant player on the sell side. I mean, it certainly felt easier being a seller than a, a <laughs> buyer. You know, as m- myself personally, I was mostly buying at 1-1. And I think the retro market, there wasn't too many surprises from what most people thought would play out. Once the rate online gets to a certain level in retro, people won't buy it. So it really became a question of how do you make that market between demand and supply, which happened late, but did fall into place. I think then when you get into the reinsurance market, again, it happened quite late. But for me, reinsurers set out to do a couple of things. They really wanted to increase attachment points. They wanted to push risk back to insurers and they also wanted to do something about pricing but i think i think the key thing reinsurers wanted to do was to do with terms and conditions excluding certain things and getting their return periods higher through attachment points and actually i think reinsurance market achieved those things and now it's a question of the insurers will have expected most of that some may have expected all of it i think actually things shifted a little bit further than a lot of people anticipated in September, October time. And now we kind of move into this piece of, well, how's the insurance market going to react to some of those reinsurance changes? Yeah, that is the big point, isn't it? Obviously, this changing cycle of the last three, four, five years, traditionally, it's more been the reinsurance tail wagging the insurance dog at some point, reminding it that we all we need to harden up and we need to toughen up after a prolonged soft market. This time, it was more that the dog managed to wag itself. <laughs> And then now the reinsurance tail has woken up and has wagged the dog again. So is the extra knock-on effect is obviously we've had insurance hardening in different places and resetting itself without without being prompted by reinsurance. Now we've had reinsurance give quite a hard wag at 1-1, one, one, perhaps a bit harder than people were expecting it quite to do so. Are you going to have to pencil in more hardening on the insurance side as a result of that you know, reinsurance wag? I mean, I think... There's a sort of natural swing of that pendulum between reinsurance and insurance. And it wasn't that long ago before reinsurers were doing really very well and insurers weren't making as much money. And then the last couple of years, you know, it feels like that swung and insurance results have been better and and reinsurance has had to catch up. And as you say, it's happened perhaps more abruptly than we might have anticipated. But the reinsurance market has now made that adjustment. As that flows through onto the insurance side, I think it's going to be quite interesting, actually, to see how that plays out, because a lot of insurance lines have priced themselves to an adequate place over the last couple of years. And I think it will lead to a situation where people have got quite different views, actually, on insurance lines, profitability. There are going to be certain specialty classes like aviation, marine, terror that are particularly impacted. You know, maybe we'll come on to talk about that. I think one of the interesting areas for the insurance market is some of the exclusions, some of the turns and condition changes. Because if you think about it from an insurance customer's point of view, they've lived through three, four, five years of pricing increases. And now to tell them prices are going to go up again because of reinsurance costs, you know, most insurance customers, you know, they're not au fait with what's going on in the reinsurance market. So that's not really something, you know, every insurance company wants, wants to be 
thought of as an individual. They want their individual risk profile to be taken forward. So I do think that's a challenge for the insurance industry, how we communicate with our customers, particularly around some of the exclusions and what cover we can now provide. You know, there is a risk in there for the insurance industry that some of our customers look at this and think, well, we've had lots of years of increases and now we're not getting coverage we need. And people will look to alternative solutions other than insurance. So there's a number of potential knock-on impacts. I had Alistair Swift on the show, an insurance broker in that world. I spoke to him about this and he said, well, maybe perhaps it's time for some of the insurers to actually absorb some of this without passing it on to some of those long-suffering customers who've got often, they might be very large businesses. And of course, they're quite capable of setting up a captive or doing other things that they might not otherwise have done. Do you think that's a possibility that there's a potential not to be squeezed, but to, to absorb some of that increased cost and not pass it on? Time for an ad break. We'll get back to the podcast after this very brief message. So much has changed in the last few years, not least in Bolton Associates' world of recruiting actuaries and insurance. There is more and more need for actuaries and cap modellers. Demand is outstripping supply. But this is not the first time we've seen this. Bolton Associates has operated in this market for over 20 years. We know what attracts candidates to roles and what matters in this hybrid working world. We're having conversations with firms all needing actuaries, be they syndicates, MGAs, brokers. They need pricing actuaries, heads of capital, reserving specialists. Plus the larger players looking at restructures are asking us to find group roles, such as CRO, chief actuary and some CFOs. The actuarial skill set really does now reach all levels of the board. In 2022, several senior actuaries took the CEO role, with more to come in 2023, so watch this space. And this is where the Bolt Associates Network comes into play. We can build your actuarial function and also draw on our established network to find those actuaries who have skills not only with numbers, but with leadership, people and specific insurance knowledge. 2023 has many exciting events for Bolt Associates coming up keeping the market linked up, engaged and hopefully having a bit of fun. We're good at what we do because we enjoy what we do. So if you want us to find your elusive actuary, fresh new juniors or hear which firms are looking after their staff, then do get in touch. We're on Lime Street, so we're pretty easy to find, unlike that reinsurance pricing actuary you're currently struggling to hire. Let's speak soon. Get in touch at bolton-associates.co.uk. Well, I think people will take a view on what they think the adequacy of each line of business. And there will be some cases where people feel like the, the insurer can absorb more costs and not pass it on and they're still making money. Because you've had good margin. Yeah, cause that, and because you've had the increases over the last few years. And, and I think perhaps there'll be inconsistent views on that and it'll be different by product. But people will make that assessment and that, that feels like a normal piece. But I, I do think that captives are increasing around the world, even in countries like France now have a captive regime. So that's becoming a real option for customers. So I, I do think it will be a big part of brokers and insurers' considerations in terms of how they think about that strategically with a more long-term view, you know, the price adequacy that they'll look at on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, of course, all those brokers have got very capable, very large captive management divisions as well. So that's always an option. What about in general? Obviously, we've thrown everything up in the air. It's landed in a different place than it was only a few weeks ago. What opportunities is that throwing up? You're a large business. You, you've got a lot of flexibility within that. I mean, $24 billion of income is a huge amount. Presumably, it gives you a lot of flexibility on what you can do, what you can't do. And you've got your own conviction, your own view of risk, your own modeling. You, you know, you've got everything at your disposal. So what's that changing for you? What opportunities have it now thrown up? And how might you be then looking to exploit those? Yeah, for us, I mean, Liberty historically has tended to buy the reinsurance from a capital rather than earnings perspective. So perhaps not as affected as some other carriers. And actually, one of the things about our group is that we're incredibly well diversified. If we're not the best diversified large PNC carriers, certainly one of them. Yeah. And I think from that perspective, that gives definitely an advantage at this point in time. And it does give you options. And we're not having to make big changes to our sort of risk appetites and tolerance based on what's changed. When we look at what potential opportunities that brings, I would characterize the last three years here just in Liberty Specialty Markets. You know, we've been through this sort of super growth cycle where we're growing at sort of a billion dollars of premium a year and almost, you know, adequacy was going up everywhere and we were growing pretty much most countries we operate. And you could almost say we're growing sort of everywhere in every direction because the whole market was lifting up everywhere. Now that feels like that cycle's finished and some of our competitors have big growth plans 
there's more uncertainty in the world. So it feels like we're entering a market that's perhaps more inconsistent rather than everything going up. I think for us, that brings opportunity to your point about if you've got a large balance sheet, you've got a clear view of risk, you know what your value proposition is, you know, we know what we like, what we don't like. I think we're pretty good at articulating our risk appetite. So I don't see us having supercharged growth in that way anymore. But I think for us, it does present a lot of opportunity because we are good at articulating. And also, I think being a large and consistent market, which has served us very well over the last three years, I do think that will be helpful in the next couple of years as we do get into a more transitional phase or inconsistent phase in the market. Where I think there's just going to be a wider range of views on risk in the next couple of years. And obviously, there's a differentiation in terms of, you know, some people have been more reliant on reinsurance. And then those that have been more reliant on reinsurance, presumably, they will have to try to pass on more. And at some point, if, you, if you're comfortable with the level of margin that's already there, you can probably be more competitive in those classes and therefore grow and take some of that target business off those competitors, for example. I think if you're in that position where you're very reliant on reinsurance, that's actually quite a difficult place to be from an underwriting point of view and it will be difficult for some small carriers who are very reliant on it and they'll probably have to look at certain classes of business and see whether that risk reward trade-off is still there for them and I think that could have an impact on the market but I don't think that will have a huge impact at this point in time. We mentioned this earlier, and it's a good time to bring it in now. Somewhere where that might be more relevant would be in the political risk, political violence, war risk area, in that specialty, perhaps very, very much a London market area, where perhaps some of those smaller players that were able to get things away in composite kind of structures might not be able to do that. It won't probably would have had those forces in those classes or subclasses to stand on their own. And presumably, some of them might not have the scale to actually be viable as a standalone. Do you think that's likely to happen to be a sort of shakeout of some of the peripheral players being shaken out because they're simply not economically viable, some of these classes on their own within small books? Those classes, obviously they had an interesting 2022 and then the reinsurance costs have changed, but also your point about the structure, particularly composites being broken up. And really that's a key area where that risk has been pushed back into the insurance market. I mean, there's a lot of exclusions there in the reinsurance space as well as the pricing. And they are very Lloyd's focused classes or London market focused classes. And therefore, some of the companies that operate in them are not so large. And I think people will be looking at how much volume they've got in those classes relative to the potential risk and volatility. And that dynamic has changed hugely just in a year. Who knows who's going to pull out or people will change their appetite. It's certainly going to affect some players. There's no question about that. Are we currently seeing a big shortage of capacity in those markets? No, we're not. So I still think those markets are functioning, but clearly as people digest them, and I do expect to see a reaction in those markets in terms of price and term conditions as we go through 2023. The smaller players are saying, well, we've been dabbling in this because the results have been excellent over the last 20 years, but now we've seen what the downside really looks like. You think, actually, I don't really want that anymore. That doesn't make much sense. And it's probably more than the downside. I think, you know, obviously one of the big advantages of operating in the London market, in the subscription market, is you can go into those classes largely on a follow basis. And, and the facilities, of and, course. And the facilities. And I think a lot of some of those smaller players will be looking at that and thinking, actually, do they want to operate on that basis in those lines? And I think that those of us like ourselves who tend to lead in those classes of business are a lot less affected by the following market. In terms of winners and losers of this one, one, I think it's fairly obvious that if you're a large sedent with a lot of financial flexibility and you're being asked to retain a bit more, you can just do that and it's not a problem. And if you're not reliant on reinsurance and you're using reinsurance as capital protection rather than earnings protection, then it's not really a problem. And obviously, it demonstrates your strength as a large global diversified player. I want to pick your brains as, as a buyer. Certainly, anecdotally, you mentioned already that there was perhaps some of the hardness in the reinsurance market was a bit of a surprise. And it was perhaps a bit harder than people would have been expecting if they'd come back from Monte Carlo or Baden-Baden. They were slightly surprised that suddenly in, in December things were still blocked and people were playing hardball. Some people were and some people weren't. But now all the smoke's cleared. The anecdotes from some of the reinsurance brokers that I've been speaking to in the last few weeks have been that actually, you know, the big old traditional reinsurers really, they stepped up. They were comfortable with their pricing, they honoured their quotes. And they will also put down a big lead line and then clear up some of the shortfalls right at the end where other people much further down the slip were playing hardball. 
and actually go back to the big leader and the leader had a little bit more and we're very comfortable with that pricing and, and actually finish things off for people. So in terms of winners and losers, the big traditional reinsurers seem to have come out very well out of this in terms of enhancing their reputation, enhancing those relationships and proving what they've been saying all along. Of course, it's a long-term partnership. You know, we're not going to leave you behind. Maybe we'll write less when things aren't so good, but we're always going to be in touch and we'll be ready when you probably need us. As a buyer, has that been your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think probably large balance sheets have become more attractive. Um, you know, I think Liberty is quite fortunate that we've got a lot of long-term stable reinsurers. But for me, I still think there was a place for those more, if you might call them opportunistic or smaller reinsurers. Things did happen very late. And even some of the established players were putting out quotes that were never going to get done. You know, buyers were never going to take them up. And I think we saw a sort of reckoning there right at the end where some reinsurers had to fall back in line with the market. I mean, my perception was that as I said earlier, you know, reinsurers wanted to achieve a couple of things, and a lot of that was related to structure. Once you got the structure right, it wasn't a big problem to get the placement done. And I think those reinsurers that came out of it well tended to be the ones that got to the structure more quickly and then got the price and got the deal done. Some reinsurers who were still pushing for alternative structures and then also pushing for pricing that was unrealistic, I think they had to come back in and change their views towards the end. And I think perhaps those are the ones that didn't do themselves any favour. As a reinsurance buyer would look at it at 1-1. What's been driving this hardening reinsurance market has been a much harder attitude from investors from the ultimate capital that capitalises those reinsurers. It's been a very tough time to be raising funds, potential for startups or for top-ups or for sidecars. Or There are so many different channels down which capital can flow these days. From your own view, you've got a great big global view of capital markets and great relationships, I'm sure, with different capital markets. What's your view now that we've got runs on the board? Reinsurers have done what they said they were going to do. They said from the end of Q3 2022 and Q4, they said they were going to harden things up and restructure things and reset their market. They've done that. Do you think now that would unlock some new investment into reinsurance that the new capital might come in? in the way that it nearly always has done in the past. I think it's a really interesting time for that, actually. I suppose it's always an interesting time for that because it's quite a key dynamic of the market. Working for a mutual, it's not like I spend huge amounts of time going around raising capital, no, but we do talk to people, of course, in, in that part of the industry. And I think one of the interesting dynamics is, you know, if you look at how capital has been raised, particularly in the property cat space previously, a lot of it's been reliant on models or some kind of model. And I think in some ways, there's a bit of a crisis of confidence around this issue within the industry and then within the investors who look at our Probably industry. Probably things like climate change are saying, well, does this model, I know it goes back to the 17th century and has had every hurricane that's ever happened, but how does it actually view climate change? And if you're looking at the last three to five years of results that some of those capital markets of investors have actually achieved relative to what was expected, what they set out to, from their perspective, there'd be quite a few surprises in there. And I think probably the industry is going to have to do a much better job of selling our capabilities to attract more capital in. Capital's got probably better alternatives or certainly better than it had a few years ago, given Obviously the way with higher interest, rate interest rates have moved. So yeah. I wouldn't expect personally to see a lot of capital coming in. Of course, the counter to that is you, you look at where retro pricing is, it's much better than it was a few years ago. And there'll be a lot of people in the industry working very hard to bring new capital in. But I'm not expecting big inflows for 2023. So you think investors will probably sit with their arms folded for a little bit longer? So do I really want to be sure that, that you're that right. That would be my view, given what they've seen over the last three to five years. But as I say, there's lots of smart people in the industry out there looking to raise capital and we'll see we'll see how successful they are. So you wouldn't expect any instability anyway. The question is now, have we got to new plateau of reinsurance pricing or is it going to be a spike which, you know, we're going to roller coaster where we go up and then we'll go down again as new capital comes in. It seems to feel like we've got to a new plateau that yeah. will stick around for a while. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I wouldn't view it as we're going to sort of go on that sort of roller coaster type ride. It feels like we'll we'll stick there for a you know, at least this year and probably a couple of years, but you never know. That's market forces. If new capital came, then would it be welcome? That's the question. I think for me, it goes back to what I said earlier about the reinsurers set out to achieve certain things on the structure. And that feels really locked in where attachment points are sitting, where terms and conditions are sitting. And even if more capital 
came in, those big lead reinsurers you referred to earlier, I don't think they're shifting on that, even if more capital comes in. You know, the, the extra capital tends to be more follow form rather than lead markets. And that for me doesn't feel like it will change. And then it becomes a question of pricing. There is a lot more capital around. Once you got the structure right at 1-1, one, one, it didn't feel like there was a lot of shortfall covers out there actually to us, yeah. that there was enough capacity to get things done. So I don't think we necessarily need lots more capital coming in the way the current reinsurance and retro market is organized. But there will be a lot of people out there looking at the opportunity, but I don't see a big influx in 2023. So you're part of a global business, but a big part of that business is London. And we talk about winners or losers in terms of big buyers, big sellers, big brokers, small brokers. What about the different wholesale insurance and reinsurance hubs? Obviously, London's probably the, the biggest one of those. How has London fared in this market hardening compared to other market hardenings? But certainly other market hardenings historically have not been so good for London. Certainly other ones would say that they've been fantastic for Bermuda and Bermuda had come out top out of all of those, the last few hardenings and with, all, with new capital being formed in Bermuda. Here, we've had a capital raise in London. What's your view in terms of how has this market fared? Has it been able to step up and perform when asked? Yeah, I think actually the last few years have been very good for London in that perspective. As you say, you know, if you look at the class of 2020, as I might call them, you know, a lot of that was quite London focused, actually, more than in previous cycles. And that market hardening that took place in a lot of the retail markets around the world, what they needed the London market for in the last few years actually played to the London market strengths, that underwriting expertise to price business as it increases, you know, and you even saw classes like European property flowing much more into London. So I think London fared very well in the last couple of years. You know, as we look to the future for 2023, you know, myself and Liberty Specialty Markets, we run a global business and London's our biggest centre, but it's just less than half of our premium. And as we look at it globally at the moment, we would view London as perhaps one of the more trickier trading environments as we go into 2023. It does feel like there's a lot of growth plans uh, from competitors here in London. And we are seeing signs again of business coming into London, flowing in from various regions because the London market is potentially a bit cheaper than some of those regions. And that hasn't happened for a few years. So that's something that we'll be monitoring very closely in 2023, those flows in and out of London from the various regions around the world. That's a dynamic that's potentially changing this year. Of course, year. as your kind of group, you get to see that business in all sorts of different spheres, don't you? You could see it locally as well as in London. You will always hear people sort of anecdotally tell you sort of this has come out of London or this has gone into London for certain reasons. But we do try and track what are the trends in that, what business is coming to London and why. And it feels like 23, as I say, is a bit of an inflection point on that where business is coming here for some different reasons for the last couple of years, and it's something certainly we'll be staying close to in 2023. Sounds fairly healthy, though, because that's a vigorous market that is able to attract capital and be competitive globally. That's probably a good thing. Ultimately, it's probably good for the long-term health of that market, that it is vigorous. Yeah, and I was talking to someone about that the other day, that we're transitioning into this new market phase, and that's what it looks like. And they reminded me, actually, that means we're going back to a more normal market, to what we've had for the last three years, where there are different options for people placing business and there's more of a range of views on it, which is, yeah, I guess it is more of a normal market or a transitionary market. But you're not penciling it as being your growth engine, it sounds like. No, we've grown a lot in the last three or four years. We don't expect to grow as much this year, but we've got capital available to deploy. So we're very much going to see what happens in the year and, and we will take all the opportunities that we find. But that would be fair that we would expect to be growing less in London this year than we have done in the last few years. Anecdotally, I'd heard that cyber will be the largest risk code within the Lloyds market in 2023, which is very interesting. So cyber is a very specialist market that's reset. And we've just had news that Beasley has been able to raise a cyber cap bond, the very first to be done. It sounds like cyber's very much set fair as a marketplace because we'd had this worry that, one, we'd been challenged to prove that we knew what we were doing when this big ransomware challenge came along and the market's been able to reset because of that. And now the other challenge would be, is there enough capital 
available to this marketplace to actually grow and mature and create a cyber cat market, perhaps, in the way that property has always been you know, was able to develop that market 30 years ago. Do you think the whole cyber is now set fair to continue that growth? I mean, clearly being able to issue cat bonds in a class like that is helpful to the market and helpful to capital. I mean, we've taken a very cautious approach to cyber. We're actually pretty small in the cyber market, but we do intend to grow in 2023. From my perspective, I still think the cyber market's got a few rounds to go yet in terms of where it ends up. You know, when you talk to IT professionals, people who have a lot of expertise in that area and about what we do in the insurance market, you know, you do get a real range of views of that feels like a manageable risk. You know, you're doing sensible things to, oh my God, you know, how can you possibly insure that? So I still think the cyber market has got a few rounds to go in terms of where we end up with terms and conditions, how the cyber peril is dealt with in certain cyber policies. You know, I wouldn't say we've just got all that resolved now and we can move forward as an industry. I think from our point of view, there's still going to be a few rounds and there hasn't been any big losses in the cyber, any systemic losses in the cyberspace. And there's still potential for that. So I think the industry probably needs to be tested a bit more before we could say we're set fair and there'll definitely be enough capital available to us. It sounds very sensible to be cautious approaching a business line like cyber, which obviously which has such large potential for things to potentially go wrong. The other trend within cyber seems to be most of the leaders now take a view that they need to be kind of full service leaders and very much embedded with the client and preventing loss. You've got your big customer, you're sending them alerts, you're telling them about new vulnerabilities that you're discovering all the time and adding value that way because obviously you've got loads of different clients over different industry verticals. You're doing that kind of risk prevention job. And then, of course, as soon as there's a loss, you're right in there as well with all the sort of forensic and resetting the IT and everything else. Would you be playing in more that primary way? But it seems to be the philosophy would be if you're going to go in primary, you need to go in full in with that full service, full engineering kind of option. But other other options or Can you sit more on excess layers where perhaps you don't have to get so involved? I mean, I think you can take either approach in the marketplace. I mean, for us, we will be taking more the former primary player. You know, for us, we tend to sell our cyber policies to existing customers we do other policies with as well. So that makes much more sense for us to be on the loss prevention and risk engineering side. But there's absolutely space in the marketplace in general, for people to play as an excess capacity provider in Lloyd's. I think some people do that very successfully, actually. I think that's what makes a good, healthy insurance market in a class of business. So there's lots of opportunity there, but you're not sort of gung-ho about it. Presumably with a class where you have such strong demand, you can always pick and choose, one presumes. Yeah, and which is why we've tended to deploy our capacity in cyber to existing customers, customers we want to support, that we do other classes of business with. You, know, you could write a lot more cyber if you wanted to, but we've been quite deliberate in when and where we choose to do that. Sounds like a good time to talk to you about ESG, because what you mentioned there about having a view of clients, if someone's a property client, then actually you see them as potential cyber client or if they're P client, they could be a C client. Do you have a view about ESG and risk itself? There's been some work going on, obviously, within the London market, some experiment, experimental structures set up. And there has been some research, anecdotal, maybe it's too early to tell, that one would assume would be common sense is that a really good, very on it kind of high scoring ESG company is probably a good risk in other things as well. Or it's likely to have a lower loss ratio, everything else being the same. Do you have that feel about ESG? We have done some work, given we have a lot of scale, we have a fair amount of data. In some classes of business, we have looked at it already. Our losses correlates to ESG scores. And in some cases, it looks like they are, in others, not. But then you get into other factors. And I think the actual ESG scoring itself is not quite mature enough yet. And there are external companies who supply ESG scores. We've also got some internal mechanisms. I think that actual scoring mechanism will need to evolve before a huge amount of weight is put on it. But in principle... It's not so different to we use credit scoring in the insurance industry as that has evolved. And I would see the future with ESG scores carrying a similar thought process for the underwriters. But I wouldn't want to say automatically if something has an ESG score, it's it's a better risk because I don't think it's as mature as it needs to be now. 
But certainly there's already risk by risk, a lot of conversations about that and underwriters take it seriously already. And do you think that we're going to get a handle as a marketplace? Because this is something that permeates everything. You as an insurer want to find out things about your potential insurance client, but then also when you're buying some reinsurance, your insurers can start asking you. And then, of course, investors are going to want to know, uh, or your bank's going to want to know when it lends you some money. They're all going to want to know what your ESG score is. And of course, everything that you do on the inward side affects your own score. Do you think we're going to get some market-wide standards? And do you think we're going to be able to do them ourselves or will they end up being imposed upon us? Because presumably we're going to need something that's more standardised that we can pass around between each other. Otherwise, we're going to end up with, you know, you'll have your version. Someone else is going to have their version. Every broker is going to have their own version. It's going to be a bit of chaos, one presumes. I think at the moment, I would say that the largest impediment to having something like that is more to do with how different geographies think about it. And when we look in Asia or Australia, the US, Europe, UK, there's completely different views not just in the insurance industry, there's different views in society about ESG. Each different regions are in different mindsets and different places about it. So trying to have a sort of global ESG form that sits across everything for every client feels too difficult at the moment. I suspect those types of mechanisms that you're referring to will emerge. You know, we could have a Lloyd's one or a London market one. It seems that there's the EU one is most likely to emerge. Yeah. And Europe's clearly the most advanced in terms of its thinking on this topic. And it's where you get the most customer conversations, customer questions about it, you know, which, which is really, I think, a big driver of how we think about it in the industry. But sort of jumping straight to a sort of global view of it feels quite unlikely to me. So still work to be done. And is the gut feeling that it's more likely to come from top down from from a regulator that, you know, you're going to be, obviously, when you do your return in one place, they're going to say, well, here's the new section, you need to fill in the ESG part. And then you're going to be preparing for that. And and does it sound like it's going to be more top down than bottom up, everyone organising themselves? I think when you think about the marketplace as a whole, it's probably more likely to be top down. I think insurers will look to do their own scoring and their own ESG initiatives, but getting one consistent view across the whole marketplace at this point in time would feel to me like it will come from the top down, particularly, you know, we're dealing with multinational clients, we've got businesses in different areas, that that would feel the more likely outcome at this point. So obviously, you're very senior executive within the London market, you start to get involved in all the back office, all the different functions within the London market, and some of the lobbying and the regulatory structures that are here in the London market. How's London doing, in your opinion, the big tech reforms that are going on, some of the root and branch changes and digitisation programmes that are on the way? Well, I was a member of the London Market Data Council last year. I've just stepped off that. So from that point of view, it felt like a lot of progress was made. The core standards. Yeah, the core data record. And I got to see firsthand, actually, some of the teams that are working on this and a huge amount of effort's gone into it very smart people working to solve some of these problems. And I, and I did think in 2022 that there was good progress made. When you look at the latest Lloyds and London market and IUA joint venture plan, 2023 is going to be a pretty big year. I think I think it's going to be you know the, the key year. There's a lot to deliver in there. Obviously, everyone who's involved in delivering it is very confident about it. And I think there's a desire in the marketplace. I think people really understand what's required and why it's required. We're in that inflationary environment. Though. We talk a lot about expenses, but you know, really the issue for the insurance industry and expense management is going to be these structural changes and moving to a digital marketplace rather than the current issues that are occupying people around inflation and payrolls. That's probably a slight distraction from the bigger prize. So the big difference, you'd say, is that maybe 20 years ago, they would have a whole load of people at the table saying, why do we need to do this? And presumably those people just aren't there anymore. Everyone agrees what we need to do and agree on how to get there. I don't hear a lot of people thinking we, we don't need to do it. I, th- <laughs> I think the how, you know, there's still some debate around how and who pays for it and those kinds of things will always be up for debate. But I, I think also one thing I've observed is maybe this time around, the market is being more practical the 80 20 rule comes up quite a bit. We can't possibly have solutions that are going to work for every single risk that comes into the London market. And I think there's more of a practical view of let's get something that works for the vast majority of the business. And that will push us forward hugely. Excellent. You mentioned about inflation. 
obviously inflation has been resurgent and reminding me of my youth. How has it embedded itself into everything that you do, you know, on the pricing side and value side on reserving? And how are you seeing it? Is it something that keeps you up at night and think, goodness, I need to keep ahead of this? Well, I think we, we had quite a lot in 2022 to keep us up on night, but inflation, it is really interesting. I mean, I, I was an actuary for almost 20 years and all during that time, I didn't have to quite deal with the inflation that we've seen in the last 18 months, certainly not those spikes. And I think the industry, you know, we've got very used to social inflation being part of a big US firm. Social inflation has been very high on the agenda for quite a few years, you know, there is the issue of how COVID's impacting it and people are still grappling with that. But it's been quite interesting as it's flown through into the more the first party side. And you've seen a lot of volatility in BI values as claims have come through. It does feel like the sort of conceptually everyone understands inflation and people can do the maths of it quite straightforward. But it, it feels to me like the biggest challenge that we've had is actually a lot of the underwriters and brokers who are working in the industry today just haven't really experienced it. And that has been a big communication challenge in terms of making sure that it goes into the underwriting process. And I, and I do think all of the carriers, all of the brokers have started to embed inflation in their thinking. And then again, when it goes to the customer, people had challenges explaining that. And it's not because people don't understand inflation. Of course, you, know, you speak to a CFO or risk manager, of course, they understand inflation. But it's another price increase. And I think that has been more the interesting part of the industry that a lot of people haven't experienced it like it is today. It's a routine price increase. Um, yeah. And then the communication to the client base. And, and again, you know, it feels like some of these things are slightly unfortunate timing in terms of we've had several years of increases and then we're getting further increases due to inflation. And, you know, I do think that has been a big challenge because if that isn't done well, you do potentially run the risk of ending up in a situation where under insurance and, and potentially bad press around the industry. Because the industry there's no, not it's no good paying. for anyone under insurance. It means you haven't even paid the right premium and, and then you're going to end up in a dispute. and Ends with media articles. Insurance industry is bad and we, we've had enough of that over the last couple of years. So I think that's really been the big challenge on the inflation side is partly education and partly communication. I had Adrian Cox on the show uh, a few weeks ago and... He said, well, at least one of the silver linings of inflation, of perhaps a marginal amount of inflation, but perhaps not the inflation at sort of the 10% level, but at the 3 or 4% level, is that it does make everyone conscious that you've got to revalue. You know, because if you have benign inflation for, I don't know, if it's at 1.5%, you can have the same schedule of values come across your desk year after year after year, and you don't even think to challenge them. But of course, you know, even at 1.5%, things compound quite quickly. In five or six years' time, it can be so, you know, you're 12 or 13% off. But at least having inflation means that everybody is conscious of it all the way through the value chain. And so at least everyone is looking at the values of any property, of stock or whatever. Do you think that's a fair comment? I do. I mean, it certainly focuses the mind when you see it in your personal life. I mean, I think that's probably, oh, yeah, that's yeah. happened later. You know, we were talking about inflation in the industry and how to deal with it. And then in 2022, people started seeing it in their personal lives. Whenever you're buying, you see the prices going up. And yeah, and obviously that helps to focus the mind. So I don't think there's any you know, lack of knowledge around it. It's just become a question of how that translates into the underwriting process. And it's, it has been quite important to go product by product. Different products are set up to deal with inflation in in different ways. So it hasn't been a... Some are adjustable, of course. Yeah, so there's yeah, a bit and, of a lag, but they should fix themselves, shouldn't they? And it hasn't been a one-size-fits-all process but clearly everything has been looked at through that lens of it's not as i said it really isn't good for anyone if you end up with under insurance and that's the risk if you don't do it i presume now's a pretty good time We've been doing pretty well as an industry getting our expense ratio down sounds like 23 24 is going to be an even better time obviously because we've got some actual efficiency reforms potentially coming through obviously there's been a lot of investment and some of that might start to pay off this year next year and at the same time, of course, we're getting more premium for the same amount of labour. So presumably expense ratios, everything's boding well when you're, when you're doing your planning. You're thinking, oh, good, I hope that number's going to go down again. I'm not so sure it goes down automatically. <laughs> um, I mean, so I think, it goes up, I think everyone it, wants to get a pay rise. I, I think exactly. I think inflation can hit your balance sheet in many ways. For me, it goes back to what I said earlier about really when we think about expense challenge in the industry, there will always be short-term issues, whether that be around wage inflation or whatever the current situation is. But when you look at our overall 
cost base and what would really turn the dial. It does need to be that digital transformation piece, which can be done through a marketplace as we're doing here in London, or it can be done through a transformation within your own firm. And you know, it feels like here at Liberty, we're doing both of those simultaneously. So it feels like we're in a good place on that, but it's going to be a key challenge for the industry over the next few years to keep going on. You mentioned the pandemic and something I wanted to ask was that threw everything up in the air, the whole world of work thrown up into the air and it, literally into the ether, into homework. Perhaps most of us surprised ourselves that the world didn't end and we were able to do our jobs from home and the organisations stayed organised during that period. Now that we're back into more of a hybrid situation, is it too soon or have you been able to now reappraise what your view is of what sort of resources you need as a business? For example, can you pencil in at some point to say, well, we can have a smaller office? Because it's difficult. I understand we're still in a transition. You know, people have got used to working at home and then now, of course, they're just getting used to being in the office, but it's not the same as it was before. People are not in on so many Mondays, they're not in so many Fridays, they tend to be in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that kind of thing. In terms of your own leadership, you're more of a top-down sort of person, or do you want to sort of listen to the employees and see what they're telling you about what works best? For us here, we've taken the the bottom-up approach very much from day one. So we don't have any top-down rules, actually, about you need to be in two days a week or three days a week, or whatever that might be. We set out that it needs to be through the lens of high performing culture. We need people in the office, human interaction for certain things. And then each team has kind of worked out what that means for them in terms of how many days they need to be in the office. You'll probably see today it's a Tuesday, it's pretty busy, whereas on a, on a Friday it isn't. But I think we have reached that kind of equilibrium where it feels like things are working. We have people here who come in five days a week. We have some people who do quite a bit less. And it varies by department. But for us, I would say it's always through the lens of high performance. And there are certain interactions that need to be face to face in teams. I don't think you want to lose your culture. I mean, that's really what coming into the office ultimately means. And that's the big thing for us. Make sure that all the new joiners understand the culture and you maintain that over time. That's really what we do from the top down. But a lot of the decisions about do I need to come into the office today are really made from the bottom up. And so it sounds like you can't save money doing it by saying, you know, hot desking or whatever it is. You can't really do that, one presumes. I mean, we were hot desking before the pandemic here, actually. But I do think we probably would have needed more office space had it carried on as it were before. You know, we've grown a lot. We've recruited a lot of people in the last couple of years and we haven't had to increase our office space because some people are working from home more. Presumably you have to spend a lot more on IT because obviously people would have better upgraded all their laptops and things that they're bringing in. Presumably they lose them occasionally on the train and <laughs> well, other things. I hope not, given what's on them. But uh, I think the industry yeah, switched no. over, you know, given sometimes there's a perception outside the industry that we're not the most technologically advanced. I mean, actually, I think the industry should get a lot of credit for the way it flipped over and moved to electronic trading in that sense of not face to face. I think the market did that really very well, actually. Well, Phil... I think I've come to the end of all my questions, unless you've got something to add. I'd like to thank you for giving up a lot of time. We've had a really wide-ranging discussion about everything, I think, and it's quite a year shaping up to be anyway. So good luck with navigating 2023 and come on the show soon. No, I am a fan of the podcast, Mark, so thank you very much for inviting me on. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, don't forget to subscribe or leave a like or a review or recommendation on whatever podcast platform you used to access this programme. These really help get the word out. Before we go, just a quick reminder that advertising slots are available here and in other places in the Voice of Insurance podcasts. Podcasting is the fastest growing medium and attracts a high quality audience of key decision makers. It's also an intimate medium where you, the listener, are right in the room with me and the interview subjects. Needless to say, that means it's a great way of getting your message out directly to an audience because you know you've got their full attention. It's also very cost effective. So get in touch with Mark at thevoiceofinsurance.com to find out how you could be speaking directly to the industry. The Voice of Insurance podcast is produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Voice of Insurance is produced by me, Mark Gagan. Music was written by Anna Gagan and produced by Carlos Gagan. 
Check out more podcasts and written comment pieces at www.thevoiceofinsurance.com.